they have realized that the immo you know, immobilization for a longer period of time is, has not really changed the recurrent dislocation. So that's one very nice level one study. There are weaknesses, however, in that study too, but that's very important. In so yes. so can, can, we, can we summarize and come to a consensus by saying that one week of immobilization probably is enough, seven to 10 days. If it is an elderly, a lesser duration of immobilization. If it is a younger patient, we can go a little more, maybe two weeks or sometime maybe three weeks. Uh, do all the panelists agree that in elderly, less duration of mobilization is? Yes, very yes. Yes. Yeah, one thing, okay. uh, I just want to uh, make a little bit of uh, my thought. You know, uh, uh, since now we have more opportunities uh, for physiotherapists in our institutions across the country, so we may have to tailor you know, immobilization with the pain intensity of that particular patient. So you may have to go that way. You know, sometimes patients may require a little longer because they have a lot of pain. You just can't push them to do a mobilization, but uh, you have to tailor with the patient pain, pain situation. Okay, so, so but, but uh, Chakra sir, you agree with the consensus that probably I seven do. days to 10 days and then I do. I do. Um, less mobilization and younger I do. maybe probably we go a little, little longer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so will it change the immobilization duration? Will it change um, uh, in case of recurrent dislocation? Vivek, so suppose this is a recurrent dislocation uh, of a 23 year old guy, which you would have probably immobilized for three weeks. Now, will it change for a recurrent dislocation? Vivek? Yeah, recurrent dislocation, there's no point immobilizing. Give the sling only for the comfort for one or two or three days, five days. That's all. Once he's comfortable, pain is gone, ask him to remove. Okay, any any one, one differs? Um, Rajiv, uh, you agree? I, I agree. I agree. For recurrent dislocation, there is no use of immobilization. If he has a lot of pain, maybe a sling for a few days as uh, pain goes down. Chakra sir, Arjun sir, both of you also. I agree. Okay. agree. I okay. think one question, Amit, you can float now. Yes. Which please. immobilization? I mean, the sling, the arm sling or the shoulder immobilizer? Because there are a lot of people who use shoulder immobilizer, which I find uh, not much of use. So maybe you can ask now that one. Okay, we can we can ask our uh, panelist who uses solder immobilizer and who uses sling only. Oh, I, use sling. I, use a, sling. I use a sling. sling. I use a sling. Uh, Arjun sir, sling. I also I'm use sling. sling. Yeah, I also use the same sling. So Vivek, uh, what is yeah. your point on this? Can you elaborate a little bit on this? Which one? Uh, sling or shoulder immobilizer? Yeah, no, but Amit, I have never understood that because nowhere in the literature actually describes that you should give a shoulder immobilizer. But a lot of surgeons do use it. So I, I thought, you know, this is the best, uh, you know, portal where you can actually propagate this idea that shoulder immobilizer per se, like this, you know, with the horizontal chest strap has no meaning in this. Okay. Just a simple sling is enough. Absolutely. Especially if it is a, a recurrent dislocation. Okay. Correct. So, uh, so... Um, so we asked how long you immobilize for a recurrent shoulder dislocation and here many people say that probably if you see that the duration, lesser uh, time of duration is uh, more but still it is not uh, less than 50%. Um, so 50% will immobilize in case of acute dislocation less than 7 to 10 days time. Okay, so consensus is um, uh, one week of immobilization uh, to relieve the pain uh, is enough in case of recurrent dislocation and most of the primary dislocation as well, probably one to two weeks of immobilization is enough. Okay, so this is a second case. Um, uh, Vivek Pandey, will you take this case uh, for discussion? A 27 year old gentleman, uh, road traffic accident uh, two hours ago. Any special consideration in this case? Um, Special consideration means, Amit, what do you want to ask specifically? Uh, I, I mean the, that, uh, what is your steps now? Okay, what is my thought process? Yes. Okay. So my thought process in these patients who have a fracture dislocation is one is always to rule out a neurovascular injury, always. Okay. okay. Because this always says, you know, signifies the, you know, one step higher level of trauma. Okay. Preoperative recording is must. Then you go ahead and reduce these injuries as usual. Once it is reduced, then again, you reassess all the neurovascular injuries. If the GT is sitting perfect, 
this this perfectly. is the one post reduction yeah i'll come to that so if gt is sitting perfectly within a millimeter or two or max three of displacement here and there hardly any angulation then i will leave it like that i will not do any other investigation especially the ct scan because sometimes there are some hidden line in the neck of the humerus this has been observed if you have a slightest of doubt and even if you feel that your gt is not much displaced go ahead and do the ct and rule out any other fracture if there is no other fracture visible then you can repeat the x-ray 10 days and if the gt seems to be further displacing not acceptable go ahead with fixation this patient i will probably if finances are okay i will do the ct because this is not acceptable for me okay this will eventually displace and i will fix it so this is uh, displaced so you will do a ct scan this this is the ct scan that we did for uh, that particular patient um... exactly you see how innocuous partly innocuous it was looking on an x ray it looked just this way going i mean just upwards but in fact it is rotated yes the infra pull yes. is on very very high on this so the, the point i wanted to make here is also the same thing that uh, um the gt fracture should not be taken very lightly even if it is the classic teaching was 1 cm of displacement but uh, uh, as vivek was trying to say it should not be taken very lightly and then uh, the indication for treatment of uh, gt fracture along with the recurrent dislocation has uh, evolved over a period of uh, years now and many say that surgical fixation is indicated for 3 to 5 mm of displacement depending upon the uh, patient's age and the activity level and it has been demonstrated that displacement of the greater tuberosity by more than 5 mm is associated with on satisfactory result and this is what we did uh, to this this patient uh, about two years follow up uh, he is doing well uh, i'll not go into detail of uh, method of fixation but can we come to a consensus by saying that gt fracture requires special consideration as vivek was trying to say that these are different than a uh, normal shoulder dislocation even if it, the gt fracture is very small one chakra sir you agree you want yeah. to add something perfect uh, rajiv you want to add something yeah no i agree i agree uh, and, and you must take care of these fractures yeah you must okay. so so my you must do them early also you must do them early you must do them must early do the so surgery vivek, early also okay so vivek what percentage of your patient with gt fracture uh, undergoes ct scan um will be a bit biased data because amit most of the people who have gt fracture who need intervention will come to me only when they need intervention okay a lot of private practitioners will send me only when they find uh, but if i see the primarily who are, who have come to us about 30 to 40% 40% 40% so you 40%. you base upon you base upon x ray uh, first we always do the x ray amit always ap true ap because your x ray was not true ap so this was in rotation so you try to do a true ap on a second or third day mm -hmm. if possible axillary axillary is difficult so we do the well pause axillary view and then if i find it nearly undisplaced or an acceptable displacement i will send this patient have discuss with the patient send this patient and call back them at between 10 to 14 days orthopedics has got this 10 to 14 days of redisplacement phenomena so they will start redisplacing by that time if something is not displaced at 14 days it will likely not displace okay thank uh, thank so you if you manage yes. if you manage something conservatively it is important that you repeat the x ray between 10 to 14 days record and then leave them okay let, let me tell you vivek that in nepal we have about 280 orthopedic surgeon and at this moment 124 are listening to our discussion so about fantastic wonderful 50% of the population so thank you very wow. much uh, it's all because of the all elite panelists who are here uh, to discuss so, so happy to see everyone here uh, <laughs> march march 15th i was supposed to be in kathmandu yes <laughs> so mm. vivek uh, sorry uh, my question is to chakra pande sir so you can you also emphasize the fact that if there is a shuttle gt fracture also the complication rate of shoulder dislocation along with gt fracture is is high so gt fracture should not be taken in a very lightly it has to be thoroughly investigated chakra sir you agree I, with that yeah i do i do any anyone wants to add any of the panelists wants to add on this extra okay nothing amit no, i think amit yeah okay. there, yes, there is one point to be added so now you have a patient 
uh, who has a primary dislocation and you reduced it, you send him home, um, X-ray look normal after reduction, he comes back after two weeks or three weeks of immobilization, you start immobilizing, at four weeks, he's still not able to lift it. Passively, you can lift, I am talking about a younger patient, there is no neurological injury. Absolutely. These patients demand MRI. Because I'll tell you, undisplaced GT fractures are very common and they present as a big edema under the supraspinatus. Absolutely. If supraspinatus area has got a lot of edema, the supraspinatus is like a microfracture. The bone edema is a microfracture. The supraspinatus cannot exert the best possible lift up force. So they continue to remain a bit paralytic. So a patient who has got shoulder dislocation should start moving his shoulder in abduction by three to four weeks. Absolutely. If you still find it's not moving, Go ahead with MRI, not with CT, because CT sometimes can miss a gross edema. True, very true, very true. And then I didn't bring that paper. There is a very interesting paper on that, which says that if someone who is not uh, abducting the shoulder uh, after the rehabilitation of uh, first or recurrent dislocation, you must suspect the undisplaced uh, GT Absolute fracture or rotator cuff tear. Rotator cuff tear. On displaced uh, GT fracture, yes. or it can be a rotator cuff tear. I have some. So if I have an older patient, older patient, then I will suspect the rotator cuff tear. Absolutely. But if I have a 20, 22, 23, likely that rotator cuff is torn is very unlikely. But NMRA can solve anyway all these problems. Absolutely. Okay. Let's go. Uh, the third case. Uh, may I ask, um, uh, Chakra sir? This is a uh, this is a case. Uh, of 18 year old military recruit, he sustained injury while on training two weeks ago. Uh, he was rehabilitated, immobilized for one week and then rehabilitation for one week. He comes with full range of motion to you for suggestion. So what will be your uh, take on this patient? Either you go operate or you conserve and rehabilitate this patient. Well, uh, you know, what we know today is a. Uh, uh, you know, treat the military recruit as a sports person. You know, somebody who is a very active sports person depends upon. I the, my question to the military, military recruit will be: Is he working like a commando in commando team, or something very very hard, or something very official type of you know managerial role or something? Uh, it looks like an eighteen year old. Looks like a, in a big you know hard work sort of a, a team. So. Uh, let me tell you what uh, what I've been doing, what the literature says and what I have been doing. I will follow this case, not operate, go ahead with the conservative treatment for the first time. And then if that doesn't, if he comes with, a, again, instability or again, second dislocation, then I will enter at that time. Absolutely. And that that is uh, my usual course, uh, though it had changed over the past uh, few years of my experience in military recruit. Uh, Rajiv, you agree with Chakra sir that you will just go ahead with the um, conservative management for uh, first time dislocator? In uh, this patient? I, uh, yeah, yeah, mostly I agree. But what, what, uh, how I would do this is I would talk to the military recruit, like Chakra sir said. And if he is uh, doing a lot of activities involving abduction, external rotation, then maybe I could, I would go one step ahead to investigate him. See, because in certain, okay. I mean, well, agree. Yeah. Military recruit is a is a trainee. He is under training, so definitely he requires some more uh, function of the shoulder. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Arjun sir, what is your take on this yeah. particular yeah. case? I agree with Rajiv. You agree. So Vivek, you have different opinion, or you again go with uh, the same thing? I, I have a different opinion on anybody who is active. Forget the military person. Anybody who is very active. He could be stable and especially in training who has a lot of able to do. See, a military recruit can't, do, can't say that I won't do this, number one. So he, for me, he's an active person. Number two, he's young. Before we decide, like with today's 2020 understanding of the shoulder injuries in dislocation, if I want to leave somebody completely, let's say, I have to be very sure that his soft tissue and bony lesions are acceptable. Means he should not have a bony bank card. If somebody has no bony bank card today and a, okay, a bank card lesion, then I can discuss with him. See, the chance of dislocation in this patient will remain very high. Absolutely. But a soft tissue bank card maybe can be left alone, maybe. But a bony bank card, a large chunk, I will not leave it. I so will that, not leave it. That means an 18-year-old military recruit comes with first dislocation. You'll go ahead and investigate further rather than investigate. Just, uh, Yes, yes. Investigate, investigate further. And leave him. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And this is what uh, the current literature says. I'll not go into detail of this. Uh,
Uh, the recurrence may be up to 100% if the patient is uh, younger than 20 years. High risk of recurrence group, there are group of high risk recurrence group like male patient uh, who is around 20 to 29 and the high demand activities like military recruit. Um, and then primary bank card repair has several advantages, though it is debatable. But this is just recently, March 18, published two days ago, 2020. This is a level one, uh, though again, uh, Vivek was saying that not all research may be a good research, but, but this is a level one, double blind, randomized controlled trial, level one study, which says that a long-term benefit in overall shoulder stability and functional outcome in high-risk patients. So this is a special group of patients who are called high risk patients who have undergone um, acute bank card repair for first time dislocators. So uh, the literature are coming up uh, um, in favor of uh, primary repair of bank card repair. Uh, also, as Vivek was saying that if it is a bony, probably he'll go ahead and repair. If it is a soft tissue bank card, probably he'll wait. But there are literature in favor of uh, doing uh, bank card, soft tissue bank card as well. I mean, in trivia, I'll add a trivia here. Okay, 2005, uh, 6, 5 when I joined Manipal, <clears throat> one day we had a primary dislocation patient of shoulder and I was talking to my resident in the changing room that uh, why, why, why not to do, though I was not doing arthroscopic bank cart or anything, I was telling him, he was a senior resident of mine, I said, why, why world is not fixing the primary bank cart repair when in younger patients the dislocation rates are high? He said, shh, he said, what happened? He said, the boss is around. If he listens, like you are advocating primary bank card repair, in a, in, to me, okay, you are going to be fired. You know, Mohanty said is a very traditional conservative surgeon. So, and you see the 15 years down the line, we are discussing this today. This is what is science. Science is a ever changing phenomena. But, you are, the boss, but you are the boss in your institution, Vivek. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, 15 years back, I was a small frontline worker. Okay. But now you are the boss. <laughs> okay, that's a different issue. But the science, this is what science is. What we practice today will not be practiced 20 years later. Yes, I, I, I still want to Chakra sir, Arjun sir, um, Ishwar, yes. by Ishwar Pradhan sir is here. If they agree that I presented in 2014 uh, of military experience of primary bank card repair in very young and active people. And that time it was not taken very positively. But see that... These things are keep on changing, and we have to understand that these things come. So we did. Just uh, uh, can I just uh, ask, can, uh, sir, no, sir, go ahead. Yeah, this particular, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the literature that you showed. Uh, what was the follow-up of those uh, surgical, those, those uh, you know, cases? What was the follow-up period? This was uh, in this 10, paper. Ten years follow-up, sir. So the you know the one thing I just want to quote you here and quote unquote. This is uh, again, uh, this this uh, article that I reviewed, I'm really impressed. Familiar's paper, non-operative treatment of primary anterior shoulder dislocation in patients, 40 years of age and younger. A perspective, 25 years follow-up. Okay. So the quote unquote, it says that half of shoulders in young patient did not have a recurrent dislocation or become stable over time, although they never underwent surgical stabilization. So although there is a high demand patient, there are a lot of papers recommending surgery is better option than a conservative management, but we don't have a two decades, a 2.5 decades long follow-up. Absolutely. So Absolutely. this is something. So Absolutely. we must, must remember and not generalize the condition that yes. so every you know, young patient will require a surgery. So that is something I want absolutely. to question you. I think, yes, sir. Conclusion. Absolutely agree. No, and then uh, probably I have tried to cover that in consensus. Can I, we, we, can I? Yes, Rajiv, go ahead. Can I, can I make a comment on this, Amit? Yes, please go. No, the, the basic thing is, it's like this. I mean, the understanding was when we were undergraduate, undergraduates and the understanding was ILSACS is only present in recurrent dislocation. So when the patient has repeated dislocations, then the heel sacs occurs. But everything is changing. Now, even in primary dislocators, you can have a high incidence of heel sacs lesion, even in the first primary dislocation. Okay. So like you said, every primary, the first time dislocator, if the patient has problems, then he can be investigated. And according to the MRI CT scan, then you can plan and you can do surgery on first time dislocators. Absolutely. Uh, so so I, have, I have incorporated in my consensus that all the panelists... Uh, 
uh, are saying that certain group of patient, not all, okay. certain but group, certain yes. group of yes. patients yes. may benefit from <laughs> operative treatment agree. even after first dislocation based upon age, sex, activity level. So, sir, does this person incorporate your opinion as well? Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, Arjun, sir, you have to add something on this? Yeah, I agree with this. Okay, so before going maybe, to... The, maybe, um, Amit, you can add the lesion, type of lesion. Type of lesion. Yes, That's type correct. of lesion. Yes, correct. Okay, so, so these younger group of uh, people uh, should be investigated aggressively rather than the ordinary group of people. So those who have activity level, good or um, very high demand activity level. That very they true. have to be investigated more, more in detail than the ordinary people. Okay, so before going to the next case, um, uh, Nagbani, where are you? Are there any questions? Let us take oh, some well, of the pertinent um, questions. Uh, most of the questions have been answered, sir. Uh, so I, I would suggest that you should proceed, sir, because those were already been answered. Okay, so that is that is the beauty of uh, my presentation. You know, we have hundred participants, and then all the questions are answered in my discussion. <laughs> Okay, so I think I have not given chance to Arjun sir to read this case, right sir? Arjun sir? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, go ahead with this case. This was a 32 year old gentleman, a uh, weekend warrior, uh, plays um, um, football uh, and then had a first dislocation two years ago. Then since then, multiple dislocations since then. Nearly about 10 dislocation. Last dislocation he had one week back. Uh, while on sleep, he was sleeping and he wakes up with severe pain and uh, finds out that uh, his shoulder was dislocated. He comes to emergency and this was the x-ray before dislocation and after dislocation. So what, how you proceed? What your clinical exam, let me focus uh, on what are the clinical examination which is important for your decision making point of view. Okay, in this is just since uh, in acute stage, I oh, do this is uh, a recurrent keep an, uh, time dislocation, okay. tenth time dislocation. Since the patient presented with a severe pain, it has been reduced injury. a week ago, sir. Okay. It has been reduced okay. a week ago, and he is absolutely comfortable. Okay, he has got a full range of movement. Full range of motion. Painless range of movement. Okay. Yes. And then I do start with the apprehension test. Okay. And uh, see the status of like uh, load and shift test, whether how uh, to what extent it goes. Okay. And even I would like to check the at what level of range of movement it is most apprehensive or unstable. Absolutely. Uh, that can help to some extent about the the types of lesion the person might have. So, so what, and, uh, what, these that... what these apprehension test is going to tell you, does it matter? Because you have a history, patient is giving history of 10 dislocation. So how it is going to help in your uh, planning of treatment? And the, uh, I mean uh, that uh, if you do this, uh, uh, this is to distinguish so that the, the person might be having a simple subluxation also sometime. Okay. 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 So, so to can distinguish I ask, this with this. Distinguish with the simple subluxation. Okay. Uh, yeah. Rajiv, can I ask 10 times frank dislocation, two times reduced in hospital, eight times reduced by himself. And then these are the standard investigation modalities which has been discussed um, or mentioned by many literature standard in uh, clinical examination. So how it is going to help us in our treatment plan? So basically uh, the, the tests, I, I, I would do the sulcus side. Okay. I would so do the sulcus side. I would do look. It would tell me about laxity. It would tell me yeah. about laxity, whether this, uh, the shoulder is dislocating inferiorly also. And I would do a mid-range instability. Okay. I would do a test known as the mid-range instability to see how mm -hmm. unstable it is. That would tell me certain things. And I would do the load and shift test because load and shift test because I see a big hill sacks also there. Okay. So that so would help me Vivek, decide what? to a certain Okay. Uh, that Vivek, would help what me is, what to decide to a certain extent. Vivek, so what are the tests uh, that is going to um, matter in case of your uh, treatment plan? I think Amit, Amit uh, you and Arjun sir uh, brought an important point. You see, 
very rightly you said when somebody has dislocated 10 times and uh, two times he has been dislocated you have already got an x-ray that he had dislocated anteriorly Absolutely. frankly speaking i will not get any extra information by doing apprehension or relocation Absolutely. release Absolutely. now relocation release my personal uh, the apprehension is i have stopped doing it because it's a test in standing and sometimes rarely i have done it twice you can actually dislocate i, I remember rajiv also dislocated once right rajiv yes <laughs> yes yes go ahead and yes. if it happens it's a panic so i don't do True. it i always do relocation release number one okay and that too only when there is a doubt when he has already dislocated as rajiv said you try to find out what is not seen so oh, you exactly. see the sulcus sign which will tell you about the inferior laxity both in zero and in external rotation okay number two yes. you can do the jerk test posterior joint line tenderness and jerk test and feel for the crepitus you know the clicks which will tell you the posterior labrum tears okay and lastly the o brands which okay. is probably not mentioned here yes and o brands i have always done i mean in supine because o brands in standing is not doesn't leave the scapula very stable when you do the same o brands in supine the scapula is stable the body is stable same o brands which is positive in standing becomes negative in lying okay if it is negative in line it is painless and a very strong you know resistance patient is giving you it means his slap is negative that's it so that's all we need to know so if if i add that these are the very very important and the crucial things that we need to examine before we proceed further do chakrapandi sir agree that beaten score has to be done the rotator cuff examination has to be done the examination of the scapula because scapular distend along with the recurrent dislocation is very commonly and then i have not mentioned here probably your examination of the biceps is also very very important chakra sir what is your take on uh, this if i say that i agree to be vague by saying that probably in case of this case um, doing a routine test are not going to give me any extra benefit but i would definitely love to score all these kind of things Oh, that's that's a very nice if you do all this uh, you know uh, examination and uh, score your uh, give that scoring for your intervention you know uh, that might be a good idea but uh, let me tell you very hon honestly uh, when i see a patient with a 10 times dislocation uh, you know it means good to teach the students how to do all the tests it doesn't give me much information from intervention point of view honestly this is a instability case that for sure that i need to deal with that. Uh, so re I'm regarding sorry. rotator cuff, just a second. Just a uh, uh, sorry, Nagmani. Yeah, you want to ask something? Yeah. Um, well, sir, there are times when uh, the patient would present that his uh, shoulder didn't come out uh, all the way, but uh, he felt that something is coming out. Uh, history suggesting subluxation rather than the frank dislocation, sir. So, in those criteria, would your clinical examination change, or is it going to be just the same? because based on the history how do you differentiate a subluxation based on clinical examination uh, a subluxation and a frank dislocation sir thank, thank you dislocation uh, thank you nagmani yeah. we'll we'll ask this question again let chakra pande sir finish uh, his uh, answer and yeah. then we'll we'll float this yeah, question you know thank you nagmani that's a beautiful thing we can discuss now the issue about uh, uh, you know uh, this test uh, you know i will focus first thing first and then plan and my treatment accordingly whether this is a instability case or is there a rotator cuff issues or not let me tell you ask you the panelist how many of you with the instability associated with the other associated, associated rotator cuff or a tendinopathy in biceps or something how many of you can tell exactly why i am asking you this question that this was a similar examination done back in 1990 1994 2000 around that time JBJS they asked the expert around the world to examine the knee and tell their out you know clinical examination and the best clinician was right only by 82 to 84% of the time that's what i'm just telling you i i would be very honest to tell you that i will be very confused with this clinical examination with this 10 times dislocations i want to learn from you what would you give me the idea to see the way to go for so so probably a 10 time dislocation uh, vivek pandey clearly says that um, these have a less value uh, apprehension test probably um, sulcus sign is very important and load and pivot shift test he'll add a obrain test also so vivek can you can you answer someone who doesn't come with the frank history of shoulder dislocation 
it was a kind of uh, subluxation. So do the examination changes for this now? Actually, Amit, I was about to come to this point, but I realized anyway, you lost this. You see, the frank dislocators, I'll again emphasize frank dislocator among all the signs what you have mentioned. The relocation release is just, just to complete you know, your examination profile, but I will always do the sulcus test and O'Brien's and uh, the, the jerk test you know, to see the posterior labrum and clays. Apart from that, even load and shift is not very you know, good in my hands. It's okay. I never now, do that. But this is the, too aggressive. It seems too aggressive. The subluxation, see, I'm, it's, it's a common thing in life. When something is suspicious, you do more investigation. When something is apparent, it's clear. Okay, so I am even subluxators. My my examination will remain same. I am only worried about some people. Will say, doc, when I do this, something happens to my hand. What happens? I don't know. I, I get some funny feeling. What happens? No, some tingling is there. Those cases you need to do the relocation, and sometimes you do the Gage's hyperabduction test. Okay. It's a very underrated test, not discussed much, but Gage's hyperabduction test is important. When you have got even those small, subtle antero inferior labral tears. Now, in those cases, when you have a clinical suspicion not very clear, sometimes MRA can also come a bit confusing. Hence, you have to have a very clear categorical clinical idea. I agree with Chakra that said that not it is always possible to have a hundred percent diagnosis, but you need to have some clarity in your mind. If, especially in those suspicious cases, I mean, what you are talking about. Absolutely. So, you, you, what is your take on? Um, the ligamentous laxity score beaten is being a beaten score and then uh, the cuff okay. examination, scapular uh, that examination. Is one, that is my one weak area, Amit. I think majority, if you see majority are somewhere between four to six. Majority. Okay. And it has hardly ever, I have hardly ever changed my plan. Like if what if somebody has got beaten score six or seven, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the individual variation. Sometimes you know, the only the right side, actually, you see only upper limb will be lax, lower limb is tight. So I, I don't think I have changed my plan. I always go inside and take a call. If I feel the joint is very lax, capsule is very lax, um, shoulder is dislocating despite having minimal lesions, then I will do some plications. Otherwise, Biden's score is uh, over discussed and uh, under, and, and you know, lesser understood. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. yes, Rajiv, you want to add something? I think I, 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 yes, I, I think I absolutely agree to what Dr. Vivek is saying, because uh, recent uh, recent literature also, uh, we, I was always using the beaten score, but a few days back, the recent literature says that the beaten score may not be a reflection of what happens on the individual shoulder. You know, exactly. the whole body may not be a reflection. And yes. they say that even though the high beaten score, it may not, that's what I mean to say. I agree with you. This literature okay. does say that. So th this is this is just comparison of various studies, sensitivity and specificity. If you see that the specificity of apprehension test is about only 50%, sensitivity ranges between 68 to 80%. And then same thing, probably these are not. But one uh, test which uh, Arjun Sir was trying to emphasize, I just like to bring this point. And this is a paper which very nicely elaborated that uh, the, the classic apprehension that we do in uh, 1990 um, is different from a bony apprehension, which you do in 40, 45, 45, 45 degree. So I think Rajiv was saying, Rajiv was saying the same thing, mid-range yeah, mid instability. Yeah, mid -range instability. So probably this yeah. is the one test which is shown to be a very sensitive and specific to show the glenoid bone loss. So bone loss, probably this is the one thing that we have to do. If someone is mid-range instability, Probably the investigation will go into little deep and the in different direction. Do all panelists agree to the fact that and then bony apprehension test. So mid-range instability test uh, is very important for all of us. Yes. Yes. Amit, yes. yes. Can you just go a bit? Uh, thank you so much for showing me this paper. I was uh, probably I didn't read this. Can you just give me a little bit detail? Now the question is in what kind of how much percentage of bony defect? this test start becoming positive because in over the years when I have followed these patients, very few of them are, you know, they are the patient, the minute you do, 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 do don't, don't do that, don't do that. Absolutely. That kind of, and I have not been able probably to put my mind and, you know, the, the theory into that, um, that what is that critical percentage when they start becoming positive? Uh, they have not clearly mentioned this percentage of the glenoid bone loss, but they have said that this has high association 
uh, with the significant bone loss. It's probably it's twenty percent. I have to read. Yeah, let, let me go through this paper today. So I'll send you that paper. I have downloaded yeah, this, and yeah. then I'll send yes. you that. Yeah, yeah. And there are plenty of these which say that mid-range, mid-range instability testing is probably a better uh, investi- uh, clinical test, uh, which will change the can, probably yeah. the future plan. Yes, someone yeah. wants to add. Can I can I say something, Amit? Can I yes, say something? very quickly. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Amit, yeah, I'll say something very quickly. Basically. mid range instability basically what happens the stability in this mid range is brought about by that negative intraarticular pressure right and that concavity compression principle right so anything that disturbs that will bring about mid range instability for example a large grenoid defect or you know a muscle imbalance that's what the book says you know the muscle imbalance yeah, Rajiv, Rajiv, maybe if, a, yeah if you agree to me i have read a i have read a paper in which it says that yeah in in 0 degree and about uh, 30 to 45 mid range it is the bone uh-huh. stability which is very very important when okay, you go yeah, beyond yeah. Uh, beyond 45 degree when you go beyond 45 degree probably this is the soft tissue structure which comes into play so, so like a muscle imbalance muscle imbalance or say muscle and capsular ligaments okay yeah yes. so okay. Uh, vivek do you need to do you want to say do you agree that probably in early um, uh, abduction it's the bone instability which is uh, rather more important than the soft tissue and then when you go as long as abducting it's soft tissue which comes in picture more i think both uh, i i yes I, both both this is both. one thing which i'll not be able to make much comment uh, today uh, amit because i haven't gone through this but i'll tell you one more thing why some tests over the years as chakrajit sir was trying to say lose their relevance a test which is not able to judge what you need to do gradually goes out of repute goes out absolutely okay so no one makes a decision you know like why all the special x rays west point this point that point why they have disappeared because based on those x ray you never make a decision you ultimately go with ct so over the years these you know and they are not very really safe in those hands you you will not be able to figure yeah you say yeah there is some deficient but let me do a ct absolutely so we are already one and half hour uh, so this is the beaten I score you have uh, you have brought in very good points amit fantastic i'm sick of those regular webinars here you know it's like a pandemic but this is a good pandemic <laughs> <laughs> okay pandemic for 2 hours <laughs> okay Are you no no that is okay we can go on for 3 hours but you know sometimes it, it's a monologue most of the other webinars are monologues yeah absolutely so uh, beaten score i'll not go into detail this is available and then many literature still take beaten score as a consideration in determining either they do a um, um, surgery or they defer uh, probably a rehab uh, this is one slide i again like to highlight if it is 40 years up to 40 years the associated rotator cuff tears are about 15 to 30% if it is somewhere beyond 60 years dislocation uh, anterior dislocation of the shoulder the rotator cuff tear incidence is more so that is why the rotator cuff tear in elderly and over 50 are very commonly missed and one point i wanted to highlight that probably in these cases uh, vivek was also saying we have to embark on actively diagnosing a possible rotator cuff tear scapular dyskinesia is again a common so if you operate on patient who have scapular dyskinesia along with the recurrent dislocation probably they are the one who will not recover up to the uh, up to the mark so identification of the scapular dyskinesia is also very very important so can we come to a consensus at this moment so that there are a lot of still i see 99 people online uh, by saying that clinical examinations are important but ligament examination of rotator cuff ligamentous laxity scapular dyskinesia and the status of the biceps tendon there are reports about 5% of these recurrent dislocation have biceps pathology as well so these may alter the treatment plan and then apprehension test that is a traditional um and the bony apprehension so mid range apprehension is very important for for the plan uh do my panelist uh, consent to this point yes consent i okay. agree okay so we'll go next uh, which investigation for the same patient now which investigation you are going to do x ray uh, talking about the same eight in dislocator sorry recurrent eight time dislocator Yes, ten times. Okay, ten times dislocated. So, which investigation is your workhorse? Now, I'll start from Chakra sir. Ten times dislocation uh, in a thirty-one-year-old gentleman. Last dislocation he had one year, one week back. Now he is absolutely fine. Uh, so, what is your take on this, sir? 
which investigation now you are going to do now in the in the you know regular you know routine x-rays if i have any suspicion with the glenoid uh, fracture uh, i see like uh, you know and 20 percent or so uh, you, or any suspicion in the fracture i would add ct otherwise i will not add ct uh, in these cases uh, the other one is uh, regarding MRI. I have a mixed, uh, you know, um, experience about MRI. Now, MRI can give us if there is any association with the rotated cuff pathology, but if for the instability case, simple MRI uh, sometimes may not be greatly helpful because then you need to know whether this is a only anterior inferior glenohumeral issue or is there is there uh, any component of inferior glenohumeral issue, or some of those lesions will not be seen in the simple MRI, then you need to have a gadolinium enhanced MRI, things like that. So it depends upon, uh, you know, now the clinical examination somehow is important uh, to address what investigation to go through. So uh, now in short, I would say this way, if there is any suspicion of a glenoid fracture, I go for CT, otherwise I'm not CT, MRI, uh, depends, and uh, some of these MRI are futile. They are not gadolinium enhanced MRI. It does not give me the information that I'm looking. For. So, so you mean to say that if you do an MRI, you will prefer an MR arthrogram rather than a plain MRI, right, that, sir? That is, that is something will give me a better, you know, uh, guidance. Okay, okay. Supp suppose you see the X-ray on your um, on your left side. This is this is the X-ray of this this patient, 31 year old, 10 time dislocator. This is the X-ray you have. How you proceed now? You do uh, you know, this more, more X-ray views or you'll go ahead with the yeah, CT scan or you'll do an MRI? Yeah, this X-ray has a flaws in this, uh, although it shows some uh, hill sacs lesion here, uh, okay. but uh, I, you know, it is not a good X-ray. It's not a true anteroposterior X-ray for me to be able to see the glenoid. Okay. So Absolutely. I may have to do, if I want to go for X-ray, I will repeat the X-ray. You'll you repeat the X-ray. Okay. Yeah. Arjun sir, uh, what is your take on the same patient? How you proceed? Uh, I'll go with the CT scan at this moment, uh, Amit. Okay. That's because in the chronic uh, instability, there is always a chance to have a bony lesion, mm -hmm. both the uh, humeral and the glenoid lesion. And if it is in the acute stage, I'll go with the MRI. So right this is but in this situation, location. we can add CT arthrogram also. Okay. That CT can yeah. give the sufficient status also. Okay. So, Rajiv, what is your take? Uh, Amit, uh, looking at the X ray, uh, I would first go with an MRI. You'll go I MRI. would go for the MRI because I would rule out all the other soft tissue lesions like a haggle lesion, a rotator cuff tear, everything, a bank card so lesion can, with the MRI. It can occur in any of these. So that means your basic exam yeah. modality yeah. is MRI first. I'm, I'm coming to that. I'm coming to okay. that. Yeah. Now, once I find a bony bank card on the MRI, then I will go to take a CT scan. On the CT scan, what will I assess? The, I will in, I will assess my glenoid cavity and then okay. I will assess the hill sacs lesion. Fine, so I will fine. look at all the views of the MRI. I can only see the coronal view here. So I would look at all the views on the MRI to estimate my hill sacs lesion and the uh, whether there's a bony bank card. And then I would reassess that with CT. Okay. So, so the CT uh, scan would tell me the location of the hill sacs, okay. the glenoid index, and then I would plan my treatment. Okay, Vivek, how you'll take this patient? Hmm. I think uh, if you ask me today, the best investigation which should be, should be done in the the recurrent dislocation is uh, a combination of if you can have the you know a good rapport with your radiologist is a combination of MRI with a limited CT because both are important. With with ten years, I can tell you some my my preferred investigation today in a recurrent dislocation is a CT scan because. It's not about the bony bank card. There is a glenoid bone loss, and glenoid bone loss cannot be picked up either on X-ray. Even the MRI does not have the same sensitivity and specificity as of the 3D CT. Okay, so the bone, when it comes to the bone, there is no investigation which even today has been able to replace the CT scan. And more and more dislocations happen. It means either the soft tissue or the bony restraints or both are compromised. Now. The problem is sometimes I have been stuck uh, amid because I did only CT scan. When I went inside, I saw there is a larger global tear. Now managing those global tears is not a problem. Problem is paisa. 
okay exactly. you have not counseled the so, patient you have not told him that there is a larger tear which is extending to the back and you may need four and sometimes five and six anchor who's going to going to pay that problem is not the technique haggle is once in a while we see it's like once in probably two years three years i see one haggle so that is my lesser of a concern but given a choice if we can all actually ask our radiologist if they can give us a mr with a limited ct just for bone loss that's the best way out otherwise for me i always start with ct uh, okay so absolutely i'll i'll come i'll try to incorporate all of those into our consensus uh, but what what is your take on appropriate chakra sir was trying to say that this your x ray that i showed was not uh, appropriate view and he'll do a further uh, views and this is what we did it is not actually mine but this is the is this okay for you chakra sir this is a good view what do you want to see in this proper view sir what is your proper view what are the views yeah. no, this uh, this looks a uh, you know a better view for me compared to the one you showed me so I, with this view i would go with the mri instead of ct right away you will go you will go ahead with the mri why MRI. why in this case uh, are there any picture which says that there is no exactly bone loss this this is the other one this uh, not related with that one i just no, no. i mean you know there is a of course what uh, are the in, things you want to see in the in the normal x ray it is even in a good x ray it is not possible to see the way you see the granoid in ct it is not possible so if you have a more suspicion of a you know any granoid uh, you know erosion or some sort of a thing there is a high likelihood you may be able to see in the normal x sometimes i'm not telling all the time but sometimes this uh, is what so in I, that yeah it's chakra sir this the uh, continuing with you uh, this is what i put up uh, there is a sclerotic glenoid line so loss yeah, of yeah. sclerotic glenoid line has been shown That's to be very specific rather than a sensitive so this can be visible in true uh, true ap true ap most of the time if my nepali colleague agree if you advise ap shoulder these are not ap true shoulder because the yeah, beams yeah. are not tilted uh, to the um, scapular antiversion so uh, vivek do you use this signs just to decide that probably in in some cases where either i go ahead with the ct scan first or the mri first Uh, amit i agree that i do look at these uh, x rays uh, you know always especially the double cortical line or the anterior sclerotic line i always look at it but over the years i have become a bit ignorant and less you know i say any way i have to do the ct scan see i am talking heart to heart okay mm, exactly i say any way i have to do ct scan why should i bother too much okay but i do look for sometimes not only that you may see those fragments the bony bankard fragments true But in, looking at this, in the axillary view, at the upper surface, yeah. Time. Looking at this X-ray only, even if those arrows are there, okay, you can't really say, okay, there's a loss. But how much is it? Ten, exactly. fifteen, seventeen, twenty, twenty-five. Yeah. That is the problem. You know, somebody has just now put up in a, in one of the message that West Point view is nice. Actually, there's another view, okay, which is actually described. It became a fan, you know. Striker um, notch. Yes. No, 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 not the striker. No, 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 which one? But I just um, forget. It, Starts from B. Done in this way. Okay. Yes. Um, that became a fan. You know, that became a big rage about it's seven. A panic oblique view, I think. A panic huh? oblique view. That's whatever. The panic what? oblique view. Okay. No, no, okay. No, no, okay. No, no. Whatever. Whatever. Anyway, yeah, some name. Even that. Even that went away. <laughs> okay. Even that went mm -hmm. away. So ultimately, today for bone loss, need to see. absolutely Can so i just uh, i just want to yes, make sir. one comment uh, in addition to the yes. uh, comment that i calculated about uh, you know since i run a hospital i'm worried about money so i calculated in my opd if i see 50 patients and if i do a uh, mine because you know you may have to do mri or ct let's do it first then i calculated it's a 10 mri and at in 10, 10 mri means 1 lakh rupees a, a day Uh, one lakh fifty thousand rupees a day. Now you multiply by three hundred sixty-five days. How much money you are going to waste for the thing? So I just want to. It's not. I'm not arguing in such a way that whether you should go for this or that. Let's. Uh, since we are doctors, we are also scientists. So if you are scientists and doctors, let's look into that. Well, this is a X-ray, which is simple X-ray. Cost me little, and this gives me a ninety. percent of sensitivity of having a anoid bone loss to do ct gives me an idea to do that it may not be a harm 
to look into those x-rays and make your decision for further you know, investigation. Just a I absolutely part. agree, Chakra, sir. But now, yeah. let me carry the point of Vivek Pontes, Pandey, that there is a bone uh, erosion, that means bone loss. I do a CT scan where I can see that uh, there is only 15% bone loss. So now, now you'll do a 10% bone loss. Now you'll do a MRI for that patient or you take him for bank card. Let me tell you, uh, I told you in the beginning, a lot of this MRI information, only one thing I agree with Dr. Vivek is, he really pointed very important factor is, if they have a other instability, slap lesion, or exactly. other type of tear, global instability, how many suture anchors have to be placed, that really matters because they're not telling this to our patient or rotator if cough injury. I agree with him in that reason. Otherwise, let me tell you, a good shoulder surgeon actually sees all the compartment of shoulder when they do arthroscopy. And they can actually do, uh, you know, with a good history and good arthroscopy, they can make most of their diagnosis. I, it's I, in time dislocation, it is something very different. No, so, none of the panelists will disagree with you, sir. The problem is, when you go and operate, do a bank card, you have counseled the patient to for plan. three anchors. This is to plan the surgery. Yes, you have counseled for three anchors. Now you go inside, you see that the labrum tear is extensive. You require five anchors now. So there comes the practical problem. And this is what Vivek was trying to say. And this is the problem that I usually face in now current practice. So that is why probably doing a more investigation will harm lesser as a surgeon uh, for the counseling purpose. That is the only thing. Uh, that I can mention at this point. The, the, developing, the developing world is today is caught between the facts and fundamentals of developed world and the you know problems of the developing world, which is the finance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. But the, the the one bigger problem is our courts have caught up with the developed world. Okay. The courts are no more of the developing world. They will not look at your intention. Oh, you are such a nice doctor. Oh, yeah, you, you, you know, if you had the CT scan, probably you would have done the Latage surgery. They'll say, did the patient refuse? Did he say no? We have many cases which happened. So, I mean, Chakra Raj sir is also very right in his, in his approach. That why do unnecessary investigation? Completely agree with this. But somewhere we have to draw a line, okay, which is my best investigation? Okay, and I'm comfortable with this and anchor I'll manage. So over the years, sometimes we have those cheaper anchor. Okay, why not you do, why not you leave? Probably, you know, it's, it's a tight game. That's why I said, if we can manage, and in Pune, see Ashish Babulkar and couple of them, they have got this arrangement with their radiologist where they don't give the CT film to the patient, but they give the bone loss. Okay, so they do MRA primarily, but they do very limited CTs and they can give the bone loss. Okay, absolutely. But if you, Vivek, you, these two slides, if you see x-rays, sensitivity of AP internal rotation to detect the um, um, Hilsas lesion and the true AP view to detect the possibility of the bone loss in the glenoid, sensitivity is pretty big. We cannot rely as you say, but so these are good, good the evidence current, coming up. The current funda is a completely different. See, you can, first of all, with this, you can't figure out how much is the glenoid loss. Absolutely. Unless you know how much is the glenoid loss, you can't figure out the glenoid track. That, that I'm coming to that. Absolutely. So, yeah, I'm coming to that. Absolutely. So, agree. Yeah. so my point is, if I hmm. I have a plan like this, so if, if I find a bone loss, first investigation is going to be a CT scan. So I'll do a true AP and internal rotation. Uh, I'll test these lines, sclerotic lines and the Hilsas lesion in internal rotation. If there is a bone loss, first I'll do a CT scan. And if in CT scan, I can decide that this patient is going for Latarze. So that means probably a, uh, MRI will be a overkill. So if there is a less of the bone loss, I have already done a CT scan and then I can supplement with the MRI if I'm thinking of a, a arthroscopic bank card repair. I absolutely agree that whenever possible, both CT and MRI has to be done. Uh, that is the evidence at this moment. But can we come to a consensus for the poor country, non-affording people like ours, and then here we don't have insurance system like in India that the patient has to pay. For <laughs> we, are, we are no, Amit, we are no very much better off uh, except, except, you know, the uh, Prime Minister's scheme and some other schemes have, you know, we are somewhere very close. Yeah, maybe a little, and one notch little better, that's all. <laughs> But, but can and this, even the CT scan is cheaper than MRI. 
Yeah, it's it's much cheaper. Yes, if you, if you don't want to take plenty of cuts and this thing, you just do a yeah. on first view of the glenoid and the posterior aspect of the ilsas lesion and some axial cuts. Probably it will not that costly. So probably this is the consensus that bone loss is important, and we have to identify how much is the bone loss because at this moment that is one of the factor that is going to decide us uh, what is the treatment. So. Whenever possible, uh, we should try to do both CT scan and the MRI. Uh, we absolutely agree. I also have um, very positive vibes from Chakra sir that this may be over investigation, but this is what we need at this moment because uh, when we are treating a patient, it's not only their pocket, it's our life is also into the stake. I'll also tell you one thing, Amit, that the mean bone loss, if you, I mean, you also are doing CT scan, I am also doing Rajik, everybody is doing the CT scans probably. The mean bone loss, even in 100 cases, somewhere is about 10 to 12 percent, 15 max. That's the mean bone loss, 9 to 12, maximum pay 15. So that's one question which comes to your mind, am I overkilling? Okay, but then there are cases of bony bank cards, which gives me a much better plan. Okay, that how am I going to do this? Or there are cases where it is inching to 17, 18 percent, and I and he's a very active person. I say I'm not going to do the bank card repair. We'll do the the Let us go in. Sometimes my heart says, "Am I overkilling it?" But still, it has helped me in a much better planning. Absolutely. So since since we start developing a common protocol for all the orthopedic surgeon and the, all the people will understand that both the investigation have their own value, probably it will be acceptable. And since still 98 people are watching our uh, discussion, uh, probably this is a good platform to say that the investigation is very, very important to decide what type of surgery and what to do further. Okay, hey, I just want to, to uh, yeah, please. I want to make my point here, uh, you know, with the, with the one philosophical sentence that the beggars can't be the two jets. At that point, I want to tell you something. With the dislocated, uh, in time dislocated population, a recurrent shoulder dislocation, we have not compared. In our, you know, every th time you have been quoting all the literature from around the world. Have you quoted any studies from 1.3 billion population from India? Have you? Vivek, do you have any any paper? Now, one thing. This one in the population sir, of that sir, just a second. Sir, just sir, a second. sir just let, a population. Let me, answer, let me answer the first question. Yeah. Now we have a paper in JSES in 2020 February. Read. It is about the bank card because it takes about five to ten years. Obviously, it took forty years. Fantastic. It is data I am a very you know the junior person in this field. So we have been trying to do something, sir. But I agree with you that the developing world. This is where developing world has taken a big big beating. We have been exactly. only following only following what the our you know developed world you know bosses Absolutely. are saying. So we yeah. need to have our data. See, Amit is doing a great job. He has been publishing, and I expect the same thing coming from Rajiv and a lot of younger people to collect that data. Because right. I also make one philosophical statement. Data, if you say write in Hindi, it becomes data, D A T A. So data is data today. If you right. have a data, you are powerful. So right. we have been trying to publish this. Thank you. I just now. I, I just agree, want to sir. Let, let, let me, me add, sir. Before let, you let me one, one, only one point. Please, please. I want to finish. Now, with that population of recurrent dislocation, we can do a multi-centric studies where one group we just do a simple X-ray or MRI or do a CT MRI simple X-ray, and then do the comparison. What is our outcome for one year, two years, three years? So I just want to bring that idea about thinking. Is something we must think now. You know, it's uh, like uh, Maraj, I mean, uh, Vivek is telling data, data is a data. So uh, we have to come to something. So I'm a little bit worried now because every time we bring the data from United States, now COVID-19, they started to do the, you know, the PPI, PPE for the British uh, NHS, in the PPE. Then they change it because the PPE was not available. They change it. Now you can use the PPE for the second time, same PPE, third time. Okay. So these things are, you know, just like uh, not very, very, uh, you know, very, very confidential sir, for sir, me. Sir, sir. So, you, are, you are absolutely yeah. right. Uh, let me reiterate the fact that beggars are not choosers. At this moment, if we don't have our own data, probably we have to rely on someone else's data. 
when we have our own uh, data then we can say that our own data says this and that yes anybody else because we'll uh, go to next case uh, already... um, amit sir uh, i i needed to chip in a question if you permit please sir. go ahead um, go ahead um sir uh, we talked about the investigations could you tell us the exact time when you do it uh, for a first time dislocator or a recurrent dislocator is it mandatory that you get these investigations done in a first time dislocator apart from x ray ct and mri sir and uh, does your protocol change when you see an acute uh, dislocator and if you see a um, recurrent dislocator the second thing is immediately after the um, do you get the, the mri and ct done immediately after the dislocation episode or you wait for a while sir? Those okay two questions. Let, let's uh, let's uh, take the opinion of the panelists chakra sir when you do the investigation sir, is it the first time dislocator when do i do the investigation yes or... first time dislocator when you do investigation recurrent dislocation when you do start doing investigation I mean, when the patient comes to me, I start doing. So suppose uh, I come to you one week dislocation, I'm okay. So you send for uh, CT and MRI. That is right, sir. Not not immediately. I do a simple exercise. As I've told you After before, that, also sir. I don't go for MRI CT just like that. I do my clinical examination, you do, do simple X rays, okay. and then I make my decision talking with the patient. I just don't jump for MRI and CT. Okay. Yeah. So if you if send, I have to if I have to do intervention only, I go for investigation. Sometimes patient come, they say that I'm not in the mood of doing surgery. Sorry, let's not do all these investigations. It's not necessary. Well, well, sir, there is a paper in AJSM published by the famous Dickens, which sir has quoted. Uh, it came right now in 2019. Uh, in AJSM, sir, they say that in high-end athletes uh, of approximately 714 cases. They found that there was a relative bone loss of average of 7% sir, in the first time dislocator. So my point was whether you move ahead with CT or MRI in the first dislocation in case of high-end athletes or you wait until the second episode comes. And uh, when do you do it when it happens? So yeah, Nagman, Nagman, probably, yes, we have discussed that we will depend upon case basis. Uh, if it is a high-risk patient, you think of intervening. Chakra sir, yes. if you no, think Nagman, of intervening, yeah. Then you let do me answer. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think Nagbani's questions a very pertinent question, very useful question. But let me be very honest with you. How many of those high level athletes do I see every day, every every month in my clinic? So that's the point, you see. So our those studies are like the high level of athlete, elite athletes in the Western world does not match in our world. So that's my you know modesty that I don't see that many of high level athletes. Oh. And in the case of recurrent dislocation, sir, when do you get it? Immediately after the dislocation or you wait? Uh, there is a particular time proportion with no. whether you would like to wait and intervene, sir. Like uh, you said, you're going to intervene. I would I would intervene. Given the opportunity, I would like to do investigation earlier, make my decision, give to the patient my decisions and go further. That is what I would do. But that's not what happens in the day-to-day -day practice. Okay, Arjun, sir. So when you send investigations, quickly. Investigation in acute uh, or the first time dislocations is, uh, uh, Dr. Chakra said, uh, depending upon the uh, patient characteristics and the interest of the patients and the profession and so, and if we are planning for the uh, any intervention, then only I send for investigations. Okay, in case of recurrent dislocation, uh, dislocations, we have to talk with the patient, you have to take detailed history what the patient want, what for the patient has come, and our investigations, what it says accordingly, we do give our opinion to the patients. And sir, any patient time frame, sir? Amit, sir, uh, I wanted to know any time frame, as in you talk, because people so say that... Uh, okay, let, let me, let me uh, simplify this. Last dislocation had occurred one week back. So mm -hmm. will you examine immediately today or you'll wait for some time to do an MRI because of the acute condition may mask a little bit. That is what used to be said. We'll wait for some time. Wait for some time. So for how long you will, that is the question. For how long you'll wait? Uh, it's uh, three weeks because the soft, soft tissue will be subsided. Okay. Um, because because that uh, swelling and accumulation of uh, hematoma that can also disturb the mesh pattern also. Okay, Vivek, what, what is your take on this? When That's the time to advise? heal the soft tissue. In, in recurrent dislocation, um, I think it's, 
if patient is, I mean, I'll do the CT. If my plan is to do CT, I'll do immediately because patient has come to, he has not come to shake hands. He has come for some treatment. Okay, I need to give him a diagnosis and I need to give him a plan, whether he wants it now or later. So I'll do the CT. But I'll agree, MRI, whether he has come with acute on recurrent episode or a acute episode, a fresh, sometimes you can overestimate the lesions. Okay, too many shadows and signals. So I'll wait for three weeks if I have to do MRI for some or other reason. But if I want to do CT based upon some clinical and as Chakras has said, some x-rays are showing something and I'll do it immediately. Okay, so for CT, you will not wait. Uh, if it is an MRI, you'll wait for some time. Does this yeah. answer the question, uh, Nagmani? Yes, sir. Okay, so let's go to the fifth case. Um, Vivek, uh, this is the last case. You, you are taking this case. A 21-year-old uh, badminton player. First dislocation 18 months ago. Uh, dislocated 20 times since then. Uh, apprehension at uh, 90 degree was positive. Uh, apprehension at 45 degree. So that is bony apprehension was negative. His Britain score was uh, zero. Uh, rotator cuff was normal. Biceps and scapula were normal. So your next step. <laughs> Oh yeah, Dr. Toya, can you can you mute your mic, please? Yes, Vivek, go ahead. CT scan with 3D reconstruction to look for the bone loss. CT That's scan all. for 3D reconstruction to look for the bone loss. You'll not do an uh, MRI in this case. No, because apprehension is already positive. Rest of the things are negative, so I may not get any additional information. Okay, absolutely. That is what I did. This is the unforced view of the bilateral shoulder because I follow the track. Um, uh, uh, Nagmani, can can you see who is uh, the background disturbing you? Please mute. You you also are co-host. You can mute them. Find it out. Okay. So this is this is the X-ray. This will suffice you, or you want some other cuts, Vivek? This is fine. It looks like there is a huge hill sacs and there is a bone loss. Okay, absolutely. There is a hill sacs lesion. You can see there is a hill sacs lesion and there is a bone loss here. Uh, they have given us a finding that it's ten percent of the bone yeah, loss. Yeah, not much. It looks like about ten. Because if you see the other one, na, the other one is quite broad below. Okay. Okay. So this one is somewhere close to 10, 12 max. Uh, that, that has been reported as 10% of the bone loss. So what is your next take on this, this patient now? Next take is arthroscopic bank card repair without, without remedy such. So you will not do an MRI in this case. He had a no. 20 episode of dislocations. It can happen. There's not much correlation, Amit, with all this, you know, okay. um, with uh, whether the, you know, how many dislocations with bone loss. So it has still remained a bit of a gray area. I have had patient who has very minimal bone loss. Still, they keep on dislocating. Mm -hmm. So not much. I, I would not waste my money on no MRI. Okay, absolutely. Uh, Dr. P. Beck, do you add arthrogram also if you are going to see, do CT only? Sir, yes. arthrogram is now very, very limited in my practice. I add arthrogram only when there is a posterior labral tear suspected clinically and the plain MRI has not been, a, I mean, and he has failed the rehab, then I do the plain MRI and the plain MRI doesn't pick up. Okay. And sometimes a posterior superior labral tears. Okay. Because I'm, otherwise MR arthrogram, um, one is it's an additional procedure, you know, and now sometimes these radiologists, you know, there are some rare reports where there is an infection in the shoulder joint. Okay. Two, three days after the arthrogram, it becomes a bit painful. So I just do only now probably once or twice in a year, but I have a strong suspicion that there's a postal labral tear, but unfortunately the MRI has not been able to pick up that labral tear or even the radiologist writes, uh, you know, doubt proceed with MRI program. Then okay. Not so, so in, in this case, since we thought that there is a lesser uh, amount of bone loss, probably I can get away with the um, bank card repair um, and probably a rumpusas. So I did an MRI to see a uh, labral tear. You can see the labral tear is there. Vivek, can you? Yes, that? Yes, yes. Not, not that big good. one, but uh, labral tear is there. And uh, so the question now is, uh, final question, just in, in a nutshell or in say a basic terms, we are not going to detail of uh, the... <laughs> mechanism or the technique of surgery. So how you decide either you do a bank card or you latarze or you supplement with rumplissage or not. I'll start with uh, um, Rajiv now. Well, uh, now uh, Amit, depending, it depends on a lot of factors. Like for example, you measure the amount. Well, first you need to find out uh, the age of the patient is also important. Yes. But what you need to find out is the type of glenoid lesion and the type of a Hill sacs lesion. So you want to. So now you have. These are the bone loss. 
Yeah, you want to measure the I want to measure the bone loss. Okay. So if uh, so, this should, do I need to go into all these concepts of on track, off track? No, no. So no, basically, no, no. if I have a yeah, so the, the, to make everything short, if I have a bony lesion which is small, let's say less than twenty five percent, and if it is an on track on track lesion, then I would go in for a bank cut, simple bank okay. cut. Okay. If I have less than the regular formula goes, if I have less than twenty five, if it is an off track, I supplement my bank cut with a rempli sarge. Okay, Arjun and, sir. Yeah, Arjun sir. Yeah, I also agree with Radhiv. If the bone loss is less, okay, then arthroscopic bone cut. Less than how much? Less than how much? I, uh, uh, everything no. says something no. like twenty to twenty percent of the glenoid and twenty percent of the uh, heel sacs. Okay. Okay. Uh, Amit, so uh, bone, bone can I make a comment bone. after Arjun sir? Yeah, can I make a comment here? Yes. Now please. these days there's this gray area also. They talk about this gray area. Maybe I'd like to hear Dr. Vivek's comment on this. But they take talk about this gray area where they say less than 13% definitely going for a bank cut repair. If it if it is if it is from 13 to 25%, then uh, if you do it in uh, people with uh, that sort of a bone loss, you Rajiv, should not do it in high level athletes because something, that may lead to something level. for uh, next discussion as well. Here, okay, okay, that okay. bone loss. Is the main deciding factor they are going to be, you are going to consider yes. when you decide what yes. type of surgery you are going to do, right? Yes. Okay. Chakra sir, you, your, your opinion on this? Yeah, I agree with the comment. Okay, uh, Vivek, uh, you are a you are a thorough bank carter uh, and remplissager. I have read a lot of your <laughs> paper. Uh, so, what is your take on that? No, I think anything above twenty-five. Uh, whatever he is, whomsoever he is, uh, except for some exceptional circumstances, the letage is the principle. Okay, anything which is less than 15 for me, uh, 15 is always bank card, plus or minus. You know the the remplissage depending upon off track contract will not go into detail. Now 15 to 25, as very rightly Rajiv said, in a patient who is an office goer, who doesn't play, or uh, Hardly weekend plays, but he doesn't play contact sport. I will still go ahead with a bank card with remplissage as it starts inching towards 20, 21, 22. And I'll tell you, Amit, the bone losses more than 20 to 20, 22 percent are extremely rare. That's what I said. The mean bone loss is Absolutely. always 10 to 12. That's why 90 percent of the time, all these people everywhere, on including me and you, we get away with the bank card. Okay. So anything which is between 15 to 25, then I'll take a call depending upon, as Rajiv said, depending upon the age and his activity. Okay. Otherwise, bank card plus minus remplissage still remains a very, very solid work. You do a good repair. You do a remplissage. I'll tell you the recurrence rates are very low. So, so do anybody use and, and last And last is, yes. even in this gray zone, let us say 1% chance your bank card failed. Bank card by and large is a anatomic procedure by and large. Okay, if you do it nicely, if it fails, you still have another procedure left. If Letage fails, see Letage nowhere in the literature says that cause zero recurrence rate. The recurrence rates are between two to six percent. And just watch another five more years. Let the more literature pile up with the bank card with the presage. You realize some of the Korean and Japanese papers already saying the, the recurrence rate with bank card plus remplissage and Letage is similar. So I would bet upon something which is anatomic. If it fails, go for non-anatomic. Absolutely. But remplissage, you think remplissage is an anatomic procedure? No, no, certainly not. Certainly no. not. Remplissage is not anatomic procedure. But that I add only when I have a larger lesions. And you see, Amit, not everything we can match with the anatomy and the god. You no, know, somewhere we have to compromise. Absolutely. So do amongst our any panelists they use ISIS scoring system? This is instability severity index score uh, coined by Pascal Boleo in 2007. I, I, uh, I hope FBI is not, you know, listening our conversation. You say ISIS and then you... <laughs> probably this is trans transmitting through China and I don't know from no, 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 the country. Don't know what... 
very limited servers. You see, the main main Zoom office is in California. You know this. Okay. <laughs> a very limited servers in China. Okay. So what what is we don't mind. This is not that ISIS. We are talking about Boleu's ISIS. You know, <laughs> not not the some other ISIS. So does uh, do, Vivek? Do you use this for your no, planning yeah. purpose? I've always planned to do this, but never could do this. <laughs> never. Because what because what you are no, what you were trying to say is the, A's, the activities. You know, and the then reason the, is. only first three are applicable in a very solid way the sec the third fourth and fifth i usually don't do much in practice here you know see i don't do this hill sex measurement i don't do this I don't try to see too much of glenoid borlaus and x-ray shoulder hyperlaxity remains is still a very gray area who's hyperlax who's lax and who's normal suppose I'm suppose suppose i'll replace this hill sex region and the glenoid bone loss uh, from x-ray to ct scan because uh, probably that is what we are doing uh, i am doing at this moment doing ct and the mri to all my patients if i replace mm-hmm. these findings with the ct scan does it make any more sense of isis vivek but then is it uh, are you going to because you see 90% in fact 95% of your recurrent dislocators you can you can almost say 99% will have hill sex lesion so your score will remain constantly 2 Okay. and glenoid bone loss is a in a recurrent dislocation is a constant phenomenon so are you going to give a score less than 2% less than 5% 5 to 10 to 15 maybe you have to sub classify let, let us find it out and do it uh, come up with the um, amit and vivek isis rather than uh, absolutely parking on boleo's isis you know <laughs> we, we can call it as indo nepal you know score rather than modified <laughs> rather than absolutely <laughs> and then and what what is your take on uh, this uh, bipolar bone loss and then they also have uh, given us a very nice um, you know algorithm for decision making of what type of treatment do any of the panelists use this uh, vivek you use this it see i mean it is almost similar see in 25% there is the lethargy okay mm-hmm. except that the other part the the hill sacks i mean the see this autographs i mean allographs are not usually you know possible in the developing world okay so you are only left with lethargy okay and lot of people don't agree that you, they say that you need not to do anything for the hill sex side the other side is almost similar on track you do bank cut off track you add the remplacement you see it's almost the same except that this flow chart doesn't take that rajeus gray area this gray area was approaching suppose proposed by one of the korean paper Yes, yes. Is he also have mentioned? Yes, he also has mentioned about that gray area. Yes, he, uh, later, later. Yes, sir. Yes. Correct. Okay. Dr. Uh, Vivek. Dr. Uh, Vivek. Yes, sir. Uh, in the previous webinar, uh, by IAS or I think in Mumbai, by Dr. Sanjay Desai, he said that he never does remplacement. How often you do? He 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 doesn't do. No. so what what is your remplacement rate in your patient now last one year quite high quite high i mean because i to be very frank to be very candid i don't follow this on track off track too much beyond a point i have developed a new system of uh, identifying it by a new uh, instrument uh, so we can do actually on table also and that is in the patent form and uh, if the hill sex is very small amit that's what is the gen- you know the genesis of my paper if the hill sex is very small i leave it but if the hill sex is moderate also you know i go ahead and do remplacement because but for but me, the, but the location country, the depth how much medial it is shallow it is deep does it also also make some uh, importance in your decision may, it may make but at the moment it is the so if you're seeing from the superior antero superior portal it is the from the the infraspinatus insertion towards the head side means the medial side this is the one okay the width so called width not the length because not many lesions i have seen so many not many lesions are very long they are actually wider okay so it's the width now we are taking in account and i have not seen many very deep lesions amit most of them are about 2 or 3 or 4 mm maximum so i if i feel it's a bigger one i'll not hesitate do the remplacement because our patients don't want recurrence yeah. see unlike the western world uh, our patients are they'll say okay for doc i don't want to play a contact sport i'll be fine just i don't want it to dislocate so with that idea i have been doing and i have no regrets from 2012 onwards 2028 years i have hardly seen recurrences now hardly whereas before that Do you decide on the basis of activity level of the patient also regarding the remplacements pardon sir do you decide on the basis of activity level of the patient 
Yes, yes, definitely, sir. It is more in the younger patient. So anything who is anybody who is inching above thirty-five, na, then unless if the lesion is even if it is a slightly bigger and I've got a juicy bank card in the front and just five six percent loss, ten percent also, I don't do remplissage. Remplissage I reserve it mostly for the younger patients. Absolutely. So this this quite matches with the with the opinion of the. Um, the poll we have done so arthroscopic bank card repair and the latarze procedure rather than these choice of surgery depends upon various yes, factors exactly. so so it there are so many other factors that has to be taken into the consideration so choice of choice of surgery depends on various factors so you cannot refer to someone by saying that he'll do it by arthroscopy or he'll do it by open technique so this upon various factor and the expertise of the surgeon is also very very important because a badly done bank card Will not be compared with the very good bank card, yeah. and, and vice yeah. versa. Badly done latarze cannot be compared with the good latarze. Uh, Amit, so how many, you, yes. I mean, how many percentage of surgeons, the shoulder surgeons in Nepal, are doing remplissage, or they are comfortable, or they don't do it all? Eighty uh, percent of my all bank card they go along with the remplissage now for last one year. Okay. Chakra sir. Well, I, I, you know, I have not done remplissage. I okay. just go for the bank. You go ahead only with that. Arjun, only sir, can you? No, no, I didn't have experience. I, I, I do. I do remplissage when it is indicated. When it is indicated. Okay. When it is okay. indicated. Yes. Absolutely. So we are coming to the um, last slide. We have come. Uh, thank you very much. We have oversuited by about uh, 13 minutes. Uh, I'll give one minute each to all my panelists, and then one minute each to my chairperson who are quietly sitting and watching the proceedings. Uh, I'll start from Rajiv. Please give some final word, and then we'll take some questions, and then we'll finish. Rajiv, uh, anything you wanted to add on this presentation? You wanted to add something, or give some message? No, I think this is a very nice presentation, and uh, I'll be very glad that we had a foreign faculty also here. Dr. Pandey, it was nice English, to have you. Let, let us all still we have 98 participants participants watching it. Let us request uh, Vivek to be our next panelist also because we are continuing with the shoulder. Vivek, this is a pressure to you. Too. Uh, Amit, I also do knees. <laughs> <laughs> you need, you need. Okay, Arjun sir, you want to say no. something, some extra message to our all listeners? Uh, this uh, traumatic solar dislocation is very, very common in our part. Most of the time they are managed, but actual outcome we do not know. Many patients we do reduce and send, then they do not come for the follow up. But many after many years they do come. But if we could uh, make a consensus about the management of this uh, traumatic dislocation of shoulder, it can be a guideline for our uh, juniors, and our patient will also be benefited. And in order to make that uh, uh, guideline, Dr. Amit, you have taken this initiative, saying we have very good uh, uh, export like. Uh, a surgeon Dr. Vivek Pandey, his views uh, and his experiences up to the basic level has benefited us very much. So that thank you very much. Uh, Vivek, you want to add something uh, that we have missed? You wanted to add something? You? I think uh, we have discussed every possible points and I would not bore adding any points, but I will bring out something very important which Chakra sir said that that generation of Chakra sir is different but now it is a responsibility of all of you you know those who are at mid level and even the younger people start saving your data start saving your data and come up with your own and amita you have i'm so proud of you buddy that you have taken the lead of research from nepal okay and you have to inculcate this habit in everybody see research is not about publishing a paper research is a mental question what is my question once we start asking this question and pursue this question that's the you know this is of the your your you know the 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 clinical work so each one of you whatever way you want you know to save the data you can have one small google form smallest google form just have the patient's phone number see sometimes they don't come okay you can call you can find out how are you doing did you redislocate at least you can have two years old. if 10 of you pool your data of primary shoulder dislocation five of you just pool okay and say what happened to those you know if it is 20 20 20 20 patients each with five of you just imagine five years how many patients will have and that's a very good data so clinical work will keep on learning but the time has come where 
the the so called developing world because of the power of data we can actually start publishing and if it is a good data it always gets published absolutely thank you vivek chakra sir you want to add something well i i am really thankful for all of you uh, but uh, in addition to what vivek has told i think uh, the responsibility and that uh, leadership lies on all of you to bring the our own data our own information to publish more paper but let me just apart from science i just want to tell you more than that because covid 19 has given us an one more opportunity to be with the family so this has this is the first time i have been so close to with my family i understand values of life much more than only orthopedics so let's take this opportunity to have other things to do apart from research academia but also your family values and your friends values that matters the most i think all the I best think that all of us all of us all 100 people who are sitting here have experienced first time summer vacation after eighth standard absolutely <laughs> absolutely sudeep bhai if you are there you can you can put some words and then finally final words uh, to the president of arthroscopy society of nepal and we'll wrap up sudeep oh that was an uh, exhaustive uh, discussion and uh, it's a really i mean uh, i've been practicing orthopedics for uh, last 25 years and i thought uh, i know so many things in acute anterior dislocation after, after listening to this discussion so i have come to that there are so many things i didn't know so i think our learning never ends uh, so whether you are junior or senior i think the learning is a continuous process and uh, i would like to thank uh, all the panel uh, panelists for their uh, fantastic input particularly and also dr vivek pandey for giving your time from india and all our participants definitely you must have heard learned a lot even after so many years i i learned so many things and i would like to thank uh, uh, dr amit and his team uh, nagmani and vivek you guys are really an asset to uh, asson and because of your your input uh, uh, this this association our academic activity is really going on so well so i think uh, uh, it, it was a fantastic uh, uh, discussion i am sure you thank you very much uh, nagmani you are you are not left out uh, you want to say final uh, word i mean, come to you vivek yeah, there are few question we'll take no, no, i mean i need to amit i need to leave because the sesi webinar is going to it's okay. started Okay. okay thank you everybody thank you thank we'll see you again thank you thank you, thank thank you. Okay, bye 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 thank bye. you be there uh, next week we'll i'll send you another program sure 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 amit nagmani you want to say something please um not not really sir seeing you all stalwarts on the screen is amazing all side by side and i'm i'm really thankful that you're bringing up this topic sir and everybody is finding time to spend with us on uh, the younger colleagues basically to lend their thoughts and uh, contribute sir learning should go on and it should continue the way it is sir and we then have we out, have uh, we my answered, humble request to all the have you answered all the questions all, so there is uh, there are a few of them sir i think vivek uh, had noted it down sir yes, and uh, i would yeah. like to ask Vivek, so there are some questions, sir. Uh, first, I would like to start with my Quickly, one question. Let's take let's take okay. two question because we are overshooting time. Uh, take two okay, questions. okay. Just like in knee, uh, the the repairability decreases with uh, the time as meniscus and all uh, cartilage. Uh, does it apply in shoulder as well? The the bank card bank card lesion repair repairability decreases with time or not? Are there any papers suggesting such thing? Chakra sir, you would like to take this. So, in in simple words, uh, three time dislocator and the twenty time dislocator. Does uh, it makes any sense? Yeah, I think Vivek's question is very valid. Uh, what we know today is, uh, if you have a multiple times dislocation, the capsular lateral structure will be much more thinner, and some of these injuries actually turns out to be like a sort of a you know like a absa lesion. Uh, so these will be you know. with more time going more dislocation happening uh, it it will be difficult so time does matter okay time does matter uh, rajiv you want to say something or uh, you agree with chakra sir uh, amit 
I, I yeah, I agree with Chakra sir to a certain thing. A certain amount, maybe time does matter. But again, I'll refer to that paper by White. Okay. There's a paper by White. He's done this meta-analysis. I think that's a very good paper to read. And he says, when should you undergo surgery? Probably after a 3.2 times dislocation, he says. Uh, you can read that paper in detail and maybe I won't be able to say everything now, but maybe that will help you to decide. Absolutely. But every case but is different, like a first-time dislocator also. Coming with a hill sax lesion, a massive tear. That patient, you can't wait 3.25. You have to operate on that patient early. So Absolutely. besides the individual variation, I think it's 3.2 times. Besides the some, some more question, please. Let's take one. There is another question regarding, uh, this is the last question, sir. Okay. How common is capillary dyskinesia after the uh, episode of the shoulder dislocation? Is, is it the result of shoulder dislocation per se or scapular dyskinesia results in some sort of dislocation because of imbalance in the musculature? Uh, uh, let me answer this because uh, this is one thing that I found very new while going through the literature search that scapular dyskinesia is associated in about 37% of the recurrent shoulder dislocation. We don't know that either it is because it should not be because of the scapular dyskinesia, but since your muscle balance is lost, because of the dislocation, the scapular dyskinesia sets in. And there are very nice paper, though not very long-term study, nice paper saying that if you miss, or if you misdiagnose a scapular dyskinesia before the surgery, your rehabilitation is going to be a little longer and it's going to be difficult. So probably uh, it's a new term coming up uh, in association with the shoulder dislocation. We have to look at it. Uh, okay, if there are, yes, if there are no question, may I request uh, the, uh, current president of Arthroscopy Society of Nepal, Dr. Ishwar Pradhan, to give the final word and we'll wrap up. Okay, Amit, thank you very much. Uh, much has been already said, there is nothing much I think I should add, but uh, I, I thank Amit for taking the initiative and I definitely would like to thank the panelists, Dr. Chakra Pandey, Dr. Rajiv, Dr. Uh, Arjun, of course, Vivek has already left uh, for giving their time, you know, sharing with us their expert. And of course, on top of that, the participants we had, they need to be thanked also, you know. At one of the peak point, it was nearing above 100, but now since we are ending, it is becoming less and less. But let's wrap it up. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we will be prepared for the next uh, meeting, next Monday meeting. Thank you. Absolutely. I would like to personally thank uh, Chakra Pandey, sir, uh, who has been the star and then presence of a senior uh, faculty like Chakra Pandey, sir, makes a hell of a difference. I have requested Sisir Lakhi, sir, also to be part of this discussion, but since he is busy today, he was not able to. Uh, and uh, let, on behalf of Arthroscopy Society of Nepal, uh, let me request Chakra Pandey, sir, also to be um, a part of at least once a week, one and a half to two hours, so that you share your... Um, experience and the opinion with us and on behalf of arthroscopy society of nepal myself and nagmani uh, i'd like to thank all my panelists my um, chairpersons uh, especially vivek and nagmani who's be, who's the heroes and stars behind the scene who were able to manage that and thank you very much hope to see you soon next week monday thank you very much sir thank, thank you, you sir okay. thank you bye, -bye. bye thank you very much thank you Thank you, sir.